There are two major things you should know about the cell membrane. One, it's called a fluid mosaic, and the other is that it's semi-permeable or selectively permeable. So our two lessons on the cell membrane, one will be about the mosaic, the structure, and one will be about transport through the membrane or the permeability. We call the membrane a fluid mosaic because it is fluid, meaning the phospholipids can float around within their bilayer, and it is a mosaic, meaning that it is comprised of many parts. Specifically, those parts are lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates, many of the macromolecules from the old biochem unit. We're going to start by talking about the lipids since they are both a part of the mosaic but also the reason that the mosaic is fluid and they also have a lot to do with the semi-permeability. Phospholipids are the major component of the cell membrane. So there they are, the phospholipids. Also while we're at this picture there's the proteins and the carbohydrates are in green. So here we go, zooming in on the phospholipids. Remember that they are polar, they have a polar hydrophilic region, that's the head, and they have a nonpolar hydrophobic reason, region, that's their tails, their fatty acid tails. So if you place a bunch of phospholipids in water, what you're going to end up with is their most stable conformation, which is a bilayer with the tails excluded from the aqueous environment and the heads facing towards the aqueous environment. I normally remember this in just a simple short phrase, heads out, tails in. So the tails are excluded. When scientists started delving a little deeper into the character of this fluid layer, they found that cholesterol, so there's your cholesterol, and also long saturated fatty acid tails were both acting to stabilize the membrane and reduce the membrane's fluidity. Meanwhile, the short fatty acid tails, especially the unsaturated fatty acid tails, acted to increase the fluidity of the membrane. They also found that while phospholipids can move around fluidly in a side-to-side -side directions, they rarely flip from the inner to the outer layer because the polar head would have to move through a layer of nonpolar tails. Thus, the inner and outer parts of the bilayer can be different and stay different. So on the very last slide, you're going to see an example of the whole endomembrane system, and you can track where the inner part of the bilayer is and the outer part of the bilayer is. So just to recap about fluidity, we've got a whole scale here. Adding cholesterol stabilizes the membrane, makes it less fluid. Adding saturated fatty acid makes it less fluid. Adding long fatty acid makes it less fluid. There is one way to increase membrane fluidity, and it's the same thing that speeds up chemical reactions or just makes molecules move around faster, and that is increasing the temperature. So we've got the negatively correlated, and then we've got our higher temperatures. Temperature is the positively correlated factor here affecting membrane fluidity. This relationship between temperature and fluidity is this, it's the reason why fatty acids in fish are different from fatty acids in most animals. They live in cold, deep water, and so you're going to find a lot more unsaturated fatty acids, especially those very healthy omega-3 fatty acids that we need for our cell membrane fluidity as well. They are in great abundance in the cell membranes of deep ocean fish because of the cold temperatures. They have to balance the cold temperature stabilizing effects with the destabilizing or increasing fluidity effects of the unsaturated fatty tails. Moving on to the protein part of the mosaic. 
Just to recap things you already know, you remember, maybe, that proteins have domains or different regions. So an enzyme could have an active site region, an allosteric regulation region, and so in membrane proteins and in all proteins, really, you can have chemically hydrophilic regions and chemically hydrophobic regions. And so zooming in a little bit more, you can see the hydrophobic region is what keeps this what we call a transmembrane because it crosses through the membrane. It's what keeps this transmembrane protein anchored in the membrane. And then it has a domain on either side of the membrane that can do something else. It, the proteins have so many functions, we're actually going to look at them in just a second. So they have their polar and nonpolar regions, just like the phospholipids have polar and nonpolar regions. So this allows them to integrate into the membrane, and so for this reason, we call them integral proteins. And so what you're looking at here is one integral protein, it's a transmembrane protein. This picture actually shows it a little better. You can see many integral proteins. All of these integral proteins are transmembrane, but other integral proteins might only reach into, you know, extend out of one side of the cell membrane. But you also have what are called peripheral proteins. And so those are those proteins sticking off of one side of the membrane. So, peripheral proteins exist only on one side of the membrane or another, and so to stay associated with the membrane, they're going to have to have some sort of chemical attraction. So they might have a polar region that helps them associate with the polar heads, or they might have a way to interact with part of another integral protein. So you can find peripheral proteins associated with the phospholipids themselves or with an integral protein. So one more time, just to be sure I was clear. Integral proteins are the ones extending into the cell membrane that have the hydrophobic nonpolar regions. That includes the transmembrane proteins, one special subset. Peripheral proteins exist only on one side of the membrane or another. So often these guys are going to have polar regions to allow them to associate with the lipid heads or with another polar region of an integral protein. Most proteins are free to float around. This is a model of an experiment that fused a mouse and a human cell and then observed how the proteins diffused into this new hybrid cell. So you can see that the proteins were able to move freely and eventually reach equilibrium as they distributed themselves evenly throughout the cell membrane. Now look how fast that happened. That was after only one hour. It is really amazing how quickly these molecules can move because it's such a tiny cell. Other proteins don't stay in place, or sorry, other proteins do stay in place. Proteins in the cell membrane can actually be anchored to the cytoskeleton or the extracellular matrix, or they can be held within a lipid raft. And so the lipid raft has longer fatty acids, so again, it's extra stability. They have more cholesterol molecules, those little red molecules there, and they also have a lot more of these glycolipids that anchor into other proteins. So the dark blue being the glycolipid and the light blue representing the proteins. So this raft could be, well they're now thought to be important in sending and receiving signals. It keeps a lot of proteins very close together and this was also in the inner life of a cell video that we watched. Once proteins are in the cell membrane, they can do many tasks. Here you see them transporting molecules. They are acting as 
cell recognition molecules, the glycoprotein there. They can be intracellular joints, like all the junctions I showed you. They can act as enzymes, send and receive, sorry, there we go, enzymes, send and receive messages, and anchor into the cytoskeleton, keeping, helping keep that cell in place. Lots and lots of jobs for membrane proteins. And finally, we come to the carbohydrates. These help with cell recognition, just like I've been stating, just like I talked about when we talked about the endomembrane system and proteins being tagged with carbohydrates that act like tags. Carbohydrates can be covalently added to lipids, and that creates something called a glycolipid. They can also be, just like in the endomembrane system, covalently added to proteins, creating glycoproteins. And so these carbohydrates really help the cells know self from non-self. They also, there's some evidence to show that changes to the carbohydrates that are attached to lipids specifically could signal to the rest of the body that something's wrong with this cell, maybe it's cancerous, and so the immune system can target these mislabeled cells just like they would target a virus or a bacteria. So still a lot to learn about these carbohydrates. Really fascinating jobs they're doing um, to help the cells communicate and relate to each other. So when you think about the cell membrane, I don't want you thinking of a static solid line that you draw around the cell. And that's typically how we draw a cell membrane, as a solid line around a cell. I want you to think of it as a constantly changing, dynamic, fluid mosaic. One that can grow by adding phospholipids from the smooth ER, also proteins from the rough ER. So you've got proteins and lipids now in a vesicle, traveling along microtubules, going to the Golgi apparatus, and finally reaching the outside of the cell. And so now you've got all this membrane being added to the outside of the cell, and that can be balanced by cells actually eating or drinking and taking membrane back into the cell, and that's where we're heading. We're heading into our discussion of the semipermeable membrane and membrane transport. So there will be more on that later, but I just, while this picture is up, one more thing to note. Look at the cytoplasmic face and the extracellular face. The, the half of the bilayer facing the inner part of the cell and the part facing the outer part of the cell. You can really see here how adding proteins while inside the ER ends up with proteins facing outside the cell. So that's very important later on when we talk about cell communication with each other and cell transport. That's the next screencast. See you then.